Yes, hello. Welcome to yet another episode where we shall be looking at uh, the prediction and revision of the mathematics paper two for grade elevens for November end of the examination. All right. So remember, this paper has just a few topics, but the marks are kind of congested. So question one, question two is usually the statistics, ne? Round about 25 plus minus max, ne? Not so much. So in this case, we're given a box and whisker that shows the distribution of data for examination marks for 24 boys within the grade 11 class. Okay. So the median is 84 and then the mean is 80. Seven. All right. So if that is the case, let's see. The question is how many boys scored more than one of five? So how many learners do we have all together? We have 24 boys. So how many scored more than one of five? So this percentage of the box and whisker represents 25%. Okay. So I'm going to say a quarter, or I can say 25 over 100 times 24. So a quarter of 24 is basically six boys. So six boys got over 105. All right. Then in which direction are the marks skewed? So with the direction, we're looking at left or right. Né? So in this case, I'm going to say right. The marks are skewed to the right because we're seeing a bigger space that's there. Then range, we know that the range is the maximum minus the minimum. Maximum minus the minimum. So the maximum is 127, the minimum is 68. So 127 minus 68, this gives us a 59. So before I move on to the next aspect, remember with a box and whisker, okay? We have five numbers that are being summarized. This being the minimum, this being the maximum. Okay, this representing the Q1, this representing the Q3, and then the number in the middle is usually the Q2 or the median. So this Q1 is sometimes called the lower quartile or quartile one, or this 105 will be the Q3, which is the upper quartile. Okay, now what we need to remember is that Q2, which is the middle quartile, also represents the median. So sometimes they can give you a box and whisker the way it is. And on other occasions, they can just give you numbers and then you have to do the honors for you to find these numbers, the Q1, the Q2, the Q3, the minimum and maximum, and then you draw for us the box and whisker. All right, 1.4. They're telling us that um, on checking the answer book of the candidate who scored 100, and 27, okay? In this case, we're just looking at one individual. An adding error is discovered, and then the mark is changed to 147. So determine the resulting value of the following. Number one, the median. So what's gonna happen to the median? Now remember, a change in the marks, let's say whether it's all the learners or just a few learners, it does not change the media in most cases, okay? For as long as that change is uniform across, let's say all the learners. But in this case, it's just one learner. And then which learner is just the maximum learner or the highest learner. So in that case, the median is not gonna be affected. So we're gonna still have our 84 as the median. And then when it comes to the mean, the mean is going to be affected because remember 127 is now increased to 147. So there is an extra. So initially the mean was 87. So I would say that 87 is equal to, will that even make sense? If I just stick with 87 and use the formula of the mean, 87 is equal to the total, which I don't know, over 
24 boys. Okay. So I'm taking this to be my total, first of all. Then when I multiply that, which means the total number of marks that we had initially will be 87 multiplied by 24, which is 2088. But now we are increasing from 127, 147, which is an increment of 20 marks. So if we plus 20 to this number, we're going to get 2108 over 24. So what does that give us? 2108 divided by 24, we are getting 87,8333. Okay, so this is, that's just the longest approach, okay? I know in our midst we have people that uh, will solve this very, 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 very fast, okay? Or you can just get, uh, let's say, the increment, which is 20. Like if you get 20, you divide it by 24, because this is the extra number of marks. Then you get your 0, 0,83333, and then you add it to the mean, which will give you just the same answer, okay? That would have been the quickest approach. So expect a question like this, probably, in your paper that is forthcoming. Like, remember I said, it can be a box and whisker drawn for you, or it can just give you the numbers. And then they ask you to determine the Q1, Q2, Q3, and then the rest, and then you draw the box and the score. So in such cases, step number one, you need to arrange the numbers in order, which is ascending, which means from the smallest to the biggest. Then find the median. And when you're finding the median, if um, you have two numbers in the middle, you find the average of those two numbers, and then go on to find the Q1 and the Q3. All right, question number two, which is the grouped data. So in this case, they are telling us that 55 learners were sampled at a school tax show to measure their waiting time in minutes before being served. Now that's the one to see how many are patient and how many will be in a rush to put the orders. Eh? So we have a table that we have. So we have 55. Now, in cases, let's say where they give you maybe this to be an A or R or something that the number is missing. All you have to do, get the total of everything there and then subtract it from the original number that was given. And then you find that missing number. So in this case, we don't have a scenario like that. So let's get the, the cumulative that they want us to find. So compute the cumulative. So for us to get the cumulative, remember the first frequency represents the first cumulative, which is a six. Then we get the six plus the 10, gonna give us 16. So that's our next cumulative. And then uh, 16 plus 19, that will give us the next cumulative, which is a 35. And then 35 plus 15, that will give us a 50. And then lastly, 50 plus five, that gives us 55. So the last cumulative must match with the total number of participants all learners that we have at hand. So that is 2.1. That is 2.1. All right, then 2.2, they want us to hence draw the cumulative frequency on the grid. I don't know. Let's see if we have a grid here. So if we do, then we shall put it here. If we don't, then we shall go over it quickly. Okay, there's nothing. So we can just show what we do or how we go about it. Okay, so let me use this side. If I have this as my grid, so that is my cumulative frequency. Okay, so if that is my cumulative, what I'm saying or what I'm seeing that if that is my zero point, the highest must be a 55. Ne? Let me use tens. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and probably on top there we have a 60. And then uh, down here we can have how many intervals from zero up to 20. So that is your zero point. We're using intervals of four, four, ne? all right. So that's a four, that's eight, that is 12. That is a uh, 16, 
and probably 20. Now, when you're plotting your cumulative, remember we're focusing on the upper intervals as well as the cumulative. So we're using these numbers and the cumulative. So four is gonna go with a six. So four is here, must go with a six. Six is slightly below the halfway mark or slightly above the halfway mark, okay? Then the next one, which is eight, is gonna go with 16. 16 is slightly somewhere there. Remember, it's an estimate, it's a sketch. Then 35 is 12. So 12 is a 35, which is just halfway. I'll just put it somewhere there. And then I have 50 for 16. 16 is 50, which is somewhere there. And then 20 is 55, which is not so far away from there. All right, so just forgive my sketch. I don't have a grid page, but at least I just want us to have an idea. Then from there, just connect with your free hand, no ruler in this case. So free as a graph. Then uh, use the cumulative to estimate the number of learners who, want, who waited more than 14 minutes. So for 14, we know that 14 is halfway between 12 and 16. So we just need to draw a straight line that goes up until the graph. Ne? From here until the graph. I know my, my line is not that straight, but we must just have the idea. So this is the time in minutes. Okay, then we need to change this or turn it horizontally to that sort of direction. So if we do that, if we do that, what we're going to end up with is um, something, something, something that is not far from our desire. Eh? So I'm getting something like a 50, no, it's a 40 something. Remember, this was a 55. That was the point of interest. So if this is a 40, slightly below 45, so I can take it to be a 43. Then I subtract it to 55 minus 43. Okay, remember it's an estimation, so we have 12 learners. Or somebody can also look at a 12 or a, or a 44, something like that. So 42, 44, it's an estimation. So we have 12 learners that obtained above. So when the question comes and asking for above, more than you subtract from the maximum, okay? Then now, uh, Next question, we say this at 12. Write down the model class. So model class is basically a class if we are to use the cumulative graph. Does that make sense? We need to use the cumulative. Uh, we don't need, we don't need the cumulative. We can look at just the number of learners and see which ones or which class has more learners. We can see that the 19 is the modal frequency. So the class is eight less x, less or equal to 12. Now, let's say you were not given this table and you were just given a cumulative graph. How we can tell is by looking at these red dots, okay? The distance between the red dots will tell us about the model class. So the class where the red dots have a bigger distance in between. So we can see that between this and this, the distance is longer compared to this and that and then this and that. So eight to 12 becomes the model class interval. Then use your graph to estimate the interquartile range. So for us to get the interquartile range, remember you get the Q3 minus the Q1. So we need to find what is our Q3. Q3, we know that um, that is 75% or three quarters. So what is three quarters? That's 0 0.75 eh? times 56, which is going to be a 42. Okay, so for me to get the position, I'm saying three quarters of n plus one. Remember my n is 55. So three quarters of 56, we're getting a 42. So if we look at a 42 from the cumulative perspective, remember we said it's somewhere slightly there which is going to be a 14 or 13 or something of the sort, but around 14. So I'm getting 14 as my Q3. 
And then my Q1, remember it's a quarter of um, 56, a quarter of 56, which is like a 29 comma something, just below, below, below 30, slightly below 30 if I move that up until it meets that. So it is slightly after 12. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? A quarter. I'm saying 0, 0,25 times 56. I'm getting 14, not 13. The 14 was wondering. Okay, 14. So if it's a 14, is somewhere there. So if I move it there, it's going to be slightly below 8. Let's take it to be a 7 in this case. So which means our interquartile range becomes a 7. Remember, you guys will have straight rulers. Now. So you should be able to get precise values or precise accurate numbers. Okay, so that is how this would have been obtained. And that's how the question would have, especially for the final year papers, that doesn't have a cumulative frequency because that's grade 11 work. So we usually love to test people, we would test learners about. Know how to sketch it. Okay, at least go to the paper with the idea of how to sketch or draw, with the idea of how to complete a cumulative frequency table. If you're given missing numbers, even if it is from the cumulative, let's say you can be given the cumulative and then you need to find these numbers. What drives or the leading role must be you knowing that the first cumulative must always be the same as the first frequency. Then you can move backwards. So 16 minus 6 gives you a 10. 35 minus 16 is a 19. 50 minus 30 is that, and then so on and so forth, okay? So if knowing that, or sometimes we can give you the frequency graph, and then you have to answer questions from there. All right, guys. So I'll leave statistics and then move on to analytical geometry. So question number three. They're telling us that collinear points are points that lie on the same straight line. And for as long as the points are lying on the same straight line, it simply means that they have the same gradient. Or in other words, the gradient between the points has to be the same. So they want us to get the value of x. So let me just decide and say a is negative 8 and 0. Okay, negative 8 and 0. Then our b is um, x minus 5, negative 8. And then C is X and negative 14. Okay, so I'm going to say that the gradient of um, AC should be the same as the gradient of, um, let me say AB, but regardless of which one you use, you should be able to get the same answer. Okay, so we know that Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1, just the gradient formula, substitute. So for AC, I'm going to have um, 0 minus minus 14 over negative 8 minus x is equal to, that's going to be 0 minus minus 8 over negative 8 minus x minus 5. Okay, so let me simplify this. So that's going to be 14 over negative 8 minus x is equal to 8 over negative 8 plus x plus 5. I'll do the cross multiplication at this point. So I know that a negative 8 and a 5 is going to be negative 3. So it is going to be negative 42 plus 14x is equal to 8, and that is negative 64 minus 8x. Then let's transpose the x's. Eh? Let me move the h that side. Let me move this number that side. So it's going to be 14x plus 8x is negative 64 plus a 14. So 22x is equal to negative 64. Okay, so negative 64 plus 42 is giving me a negative 22. Divide both sides by 22, which means x is negative one, wow. 
or a sweet question. So X is negative one. Okay, then 3.2. They're telling us that um, A. Okay. Let me just make it, I think that's better. So A is two and 10, B six and negative two, C is zero and negative six, but says of a triangle. Points D and E are X intercepts and set line, A, C and B so respectively study that and answer the questions. So what we need to do whenever we have a question of this nature, okay? whenever we have a question of this nature, is to understand that they want to test us on how to calculate the gradient, how to determine the distance, the midpoint, the equations of straight lines, as well as um, the inclination, okay? Could be a triangle. It could be even a pyrogram of any other 2D shape. So they want us to get the midpoint of BC. So BC. So for midpoint, we know that um, it's X plus X1 over two, and then Y plus Y1 over two. So I'm gonna say two plus six divided by two, and then uh, 10 plus negative two divided by two. So that's eight and that, so it's a four. And then that's gonna be eight over two, which is a four. So M is four and four. All right, then 3.2.2, they want us to get the length of AC and we must leave our answer in a sad form, AC. So we apply the distance formula, which is X minus X1 squared and then y minus y1 squared. When you do the substitution, that's gonna be two minus zero squared plus 10 minus minus six squared under the square root. So when I punch that into the calculator, that's gonna be two squared, which is a four. That is a 16, which is 256 ne? and the square root, which gives us a 260. 16 squared is 256, correct. So square root of uh, 216, square root of 260 is giving me two root 65 units. Ne? Two root 65 units, and that becomes Oh, wait a minute, 3.2.1, they say BC, not AB, BC. Let's just go back and fix that, BC. So which means it's, um. thank you for noticing that. It's, this is a zero, and then this is going to be negative six. Someone picked that up. Okay, so that's gonna be a three and, um, Negative eight, which is negative four. So this is um three and negative four. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That is the correct M. This nope. All right, so two root sixty-five becomes our answer. Then now uh, three point point three, write down the coordinates of F. If A, B, C, C, F is a pyrogram. If A, B, C, F is a paragraph. So if let's say I have this point F somewhere there. I'm not saying it's supposed to be there, but let's say it's somewhere there. Did they tell us the position of F? No. It could be A, B, because they said A, B, C, F. Could have been A, B, F, C. So that this also makes much more sense. So it depends on how, but for two months, for two months, then it's not gonna make sense. It's not gonna make sense. But let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. 
So if this F is a pyrogram, A, B, C, F, which means we're looking at this point here. And we know that the midpoint is going to be 10 and negative six, that's a four, which means it's gonna be a two, and then uh, a one. So one and two is the midpoint. So six can go with a negative four. Okay, let's see. So you get the midpoint of AC. Okay, midpoint of AC. And then this midpoint of AC must be the same as the midpoint of FB. So in other words, for pyrogram, the diagonals share one same midpoint. That is the trick on how to go about this. So the easiest is negative four. And then for me to get a two, I can use a six. Because six and negative, this is negative. So it's a negative four and a six. In other words, you are playing around with this point and this point. So the best would be four and six. I don't know why they gave it two marks, yet I feel like there is a lot of work to be done. Then can we show that A, B, C, F is not a rectangle? A, B, C, F. A, B, C, F. Okay, so if we're looking at A, B, C, F, it's not a rectangle. We just need to prove that there's no 90 degree. Okay. Use any two sides. I can look at maybe A, B, and this, B, C. Find the gradients and then uh, multiply the gradients. If I don't get a negative one, then there's no 90 degree. Then I'll know that it's a, it's, it's not a, a rectangle. Okay, so let me just jot this down here and say that the gradient of AB is going to be 10 minus minus that, which is a 12, over 2 minus 6, which is negative 4, which means my gradient is negative 3. Then let me get the gradient of uh, BC. So it's a negative 2 minus minus 6, which is a 4, over 6 minus 0, which is that. This gives me 2 over 3. So when I multiply the 2, we say negative 3 multiplied by 2 over 3 is giving us negative 2, which is not the same as negative 1. There are four. A, B, C, F. It's not a rectangle because it does not satisfy the conditions of perpendicular lines. Then they want us to get the equations of the line A, B and uh, A, C. A, B and A, C. So we know that uh, equations of lines will require you to get the gradient as well as the intercepts now. It's five marks. Okay, not bad. So we know the gradient of AB is negative three. So let me find the equation straight away. So I'm going to say Y minus 10 is equal to negative three into X minus two. Then Y is gonna be negative three X plus six plus 10. So it means a negative 3x plus 16. So that's the equation of AB. Then for AC, all I need is just a gradient. I already have the y-intercept as negative 6. Okay. So my gradient of AC, we're saying 10 minus minus 6, which is a 16, over 2 minus, minus that, which is a 2. 2 minus 0, so wait a minute. So 10 minus minus 6, that is that, which is a positive gradient. Okay, so my gradient is 8, which means the equation is going to be 8x minus 6. So this for AC, that is for AB. Then hence, so otherwise, they want us to get the size of A. Hence, or otherwise, they want us to get this angle here. So if that is your theta, all you need will be the angles of inclination. Okay, let's just eliminate some of this. Okay, so for us to get the angle of inclination, we can use the gradients. Eh? We can use the gradients. 
So we say the gradient here was negative three. And then the gradient here, we found it to be eight. Okay, so eight and uh, negative three, I'll say that uh, if this is my alpha, then that is my beta. For me to get beta, I'll say the arc turn of eight. So shift turn of eight is 82 comma eight seven. And then for me to get the alpha, it's gonna be the shift turn. Remember we said this was a negative three. Yeah? And then I'm gonna plus 180 since it's a negative angle. So shift turn of negative three, and then plus 180, that gives me 108 comma four three. So if this is 82,87, this is 108,43. Then I just need to subtract these two for me to get the theta. So A is gonna be 108,43 minus 82,87. 108,43 minus 82,87. This gives me 25,56. So that becomes the size of our angle A. All right, so that's what happens. Now, there are cases. You know? Now, before before I explain the cases, they want us to get the area of A, D, E. A, D, and E. How many marks is it? Five marks. So the only thing we need is, um, do we need the rules? If we have to apply the rules, then we need to get the distances, which is going to be a bit hectic for five months. So let me use the equations and find the coordinates of D, and also find the coordinates of E. Okay, so if I look at the equation of uh, 8x minus six, Remember, y is a zero at d, which means this point is going to be six over eight, which is the same as three over four. Okay, in other words, if y is a zero, so zero is equal to eight x minus six, which means eight x is a six, which is three over four. Then for e, remember this is the equation of e, so zero is negative three X plus 16, which means X is 16 over three. That's a 16 over three. So I can find this total distance here by getting the 16 over three minus the three over four. So 16 over three minus three over four. That gives me let me give it as a fraction, which is 55 over 12. So DE is going to be 55 over 12. And then my height, I'm going to take this to be my height, because this is the 10, so from 0. So my height is a 10. So area is going to be a half times the base times the height, so it's a half times 55 over 12 times 10. So that of uh, that, I'm getting 22,92 units squared. So that becomes the area. Alternatively, for grade 11s, you have a right to use the area rule, but you'll have to get the distance, any distance of your choice, either this distance and that distance, and then look at the angles accordingly. Now, what I was saying is that there are cases, mostly when they ask you about, um, let's say, triangle piece nature, and then they are interested in finding the angles, okay? So it could be A, it could be the E and all of that. But then what happens if, let's say, they put the angle here? Maybe this is M, and they want you to find that. So the approach that you used, in finding A 
should be the same approach that you use in finding this angle here. Let me call this a theta. Okay. So if you find your angles of inclination, let's say this was the 82, this was the one of eight. It shouldn't change. So in this case, since the triangle is complete, now you found um, this to be your 25, comma, 5, 6. But we know that we know that if we extend uh, this line, because now this is going to create something extraordinary, whereby we shall be required to extend this so that we get another triangle of interest. Then we use the gradient of BC and also find the angle of inclination here, which angle of inclination will match with this. Then whatever we got here, together with this angle of inclination, we subtract, and then we have this angle of our Z. Okay, so just know how to create the triangles with reference to the x-axis and look for the missing angles. All right, question number four, which is the trick. Mm -hmm. If seven tan theta is equal to three and cos theta is less than zero, use a sketch to determine the expression of that. So seven tan theta is equal to three. So it's saying seven tan theta is equal to three. But then they're telling us cos is less than zero. All right, so they need a sketch for six marks. What are we simplifying? Sine theta, okay, plus the cos of theta. We're dividing it by two sine theta. We're dividing it by two sine theta. All right, so what happens is that we need to remember our cast diagram. Okay, that in the first quadrant, all the big ratios are positive. In the second, it's only the sign, the turn, and the cost, and the story continues. Now, before we move on, it's always vital for us to simplify the expression they gave us or the equation that they gave us. Let's isolate the trig ratio there. So which means our tan theta is going to be three over seven. So what we can see is that the tan is positive, but then the cos is less than zero, which means the cos is negative. So in which trig ratio do we find tan to be positive, but the cos is negative? It can only be trig ratio, sorry, quadrant number three. So if that is true, then draw your triangle with reference to the x-axis. Okay, and then we're going to apply the Sokato aspects. Okay, so we know that the turn is opposite and adjacent. So the opposite is three, this is a seven, but the three is on the negative side of the Y, seven is on the negative side of the X. Then we need to find the missing value of R. So R squared is equal to X squared plus Y squared using the Pythagoras name. So our r is going to be the square root of three squared. Let me use negative three and negative seven squared. All right, so if you're using distance, there is no need of point of using the, the negative size for as long as you know what you're talking about, okay? So that's gonna give me square root of 58. We can just leave it the way it is. Then, if this is root 58, remember the hypotenuse can never be negative. It's always positive. Then I can simplify the question the way they wanted. So sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So negative three over root 58 plus the cos, which is negative seven over root 58 over two times the sine, which is negative three over root 58. On the top, we shall have negative 10 over square root of 58. And then I'm um, dividing by that, which means I'm going to multiply. And I simplify the denominator, I'm going to have just negative 6 over square root of 58. Yeah? So I'll have 58 on top over negative 6, 
when I change the sign to multiplication, I'll just switch that around. So this cancels that, I'll have um, a five over three as my answer. So that is what happened, okay? Now, alternatively, it's possible for them to also give you something like seven and theta minus three is equal to zero. And then they give you this condition or oh, there's always a condition that they put. If we're looking at the cost being negative, they can say 90 is less theta, is less um, maybe 270. So that you have two quadrants to choose from and make sure that you land on the correct quadrant. So step number one, isolate that regression to create the positive aspect of it, and then locate this to be in the negative quadrant of turn and so on and so forth. So that is how this would have been approached, okay? So having done that, having done that, we can move on to the next aspect. So in as much as the question tells you to not use a calculator, they do not want you to find the value of theta, okay? But if you do the substitutions correctly here, you can even use a calculator to simplify. All right, 4.2, if the sine of 32 is P, express each of the following in terms of P. So this, requires some elements of reduction, but in as much as also, what do you call that? Even a sketch, but let's focus on the reduction mostly. So let's take out the negative. So it's gonna be negative turn of 32. But uh, before I get there, remember we said we need a sketch. In this sketch, we don't need um, what we call those things. We don't need uh, the cast diagram or the quadrants for that case. So what I'm going to have is the tan, no, the sine is P. So it's P over one. So if that's a P, that's a one. Okay, then down here, I'm gonna have one minus P squared under the square root if I use my theorem of Pythagoras, okay? Then, since I'm looking for the tan, we know that tan is opposite over adjacent. So it's a negative P over the square root of one minus P squared. So that's how. I'll do that. So probably one mark for the sketch and then the two marks for whatever answer you have. Then uh, next, we have the sign of 418. So the question is, where do we find 418 in which quadrant? That's the key point. So if that's a 090, 180, 270, and 360, we know that 360 plus 90, that's going to give us something else, which is 450, which means the value that we are interested in is somewhere here. So if it is in this quadrant, it's going to be a 360 plus one. So what is 418 minus 360? I'm getting a 58. Okay, no problem. No problem. So this is going to be the sine of 360 plus uh, 58, which is that. If I reduce, it will become the sine of 58. But I know that if this is a 32, automatically this must be a 58 so that I can get a 90. Then uh, my sine of 58 is going to be the opposite of a hypotenuse, so which means the square root of 1 minus. P squared. Alternatively, you can look at this and then uh, get the 90 minus the 32. You reduce that to give you the cos of 32 and then apply the correct representation. All right, then now uh, for seven marks, they want us to simplify this without a calculator still. So let's break this down and see. So sine of 120 is the same as uh, which quadrant is that? That's the second quadrant. So it's 180 minus 60. The turn of 300 is going to be like the turn of 360 minus a 60. Then over, cos of negative doesn't have a big effect. So I'll just leave it for now. And then the turn of 225 is like the turn of 180 plus a 45. Because I focus on the quadrant. Where do I find 225? Where do I find 300? In which quadrant do I find that? And so on and so forth. Okay, so reducing this, if I'm to reduce this, I know that um, 
sine of 180 minus, that's going to give me just a sine of 60 times. We know that in the fourth quadrant, the turn is negative. So I'm going to have negative turn of 60 over cos of a negative is just the same as the cos of a positive. And then the turn of 144, that is going to give me the turn of 45. These are special angles we can choose to simplify. So I know that sine over cos is also a turn. Since I already have a turn, so I'm going to have negative turn squared of 60. Turn of 45 is just 1. Mm -hmm, but it's fine. Let me just, uh, let me not rush it. Let's see. That is root 3 over 2 over 1 over 2. The turn of 60, remember turn is opposite over, adjacent, which is just the root 3. I'm dividing it by 1. you get marks for that. So I don't want to skip that. So we know that um, this root 3 and the root 3 are going to multiply together and give us just a 3. So I'll have a negative 3 over 2 divided by a half. Okay. So when I transpose that, negative root, negative 3 over 2 times 2 over 1, I'm getting just a negative 3 as my answer without using like letter. So simplify all of that, you get your negative 3 as your final answer. All right, so that is how I would have gone about that yeah? for seven months. Then 4.4, 4.4. .4. 4 .4. They want us to prove the identity. Mm -hmm. Let's start from the left hand side because we look, we seem to have quite a lot info, a lot of information there. So from the top, from the top, from the top, we have a cos squared, cos and a sine squared. From the bottom, it's just that. But on the right hand side, I have no ratios on top. Okay, what am I going to do here? What am I going to do here? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when I look at the top, I can try to group. It looks like a quadratic, but something seems to be shorting. So for me to make life a little bit easier for me, which one can I, let me change the sign because it looks to be odd. So I can have the cos squared of x minus cos of x minus 1 minus cos squared of x. I'm using the identity of sine squared plus cos squared equals to 1. Then over that same thing, 2 sine x cos x plus sine x. When I open up that, which means I'm going to have 2 cos squared x minus a cos x minus 1. Okay, I can factorize that. Take out what is common, which is the sine x. I'll be left with 2 cos x plus 1. Then from the top, can also do the factorization. Is that going to make sense? Let's see. So if I open the two brackets, I have cos x and then cos x. But then what's going to happen to the middle aspect here? Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. This is a, one has to be a two for it to come out the way I wish it to be. So two cos x, one and one. Let me make this um, a minus and then a plus. So over sine x 
and then two cos x plus one. So this is gonna cancel that. And then I'm only left with the cos x minus one over sine x. Do the splitting. So cos x over sine x minus one over sine x. Do I have one aspect? Yes, one over sine is out. Then I know that uh, cos over sine is the same as cot, which is also one over and x. All right. So that is what we have to do with that proof. All right, then uh, 4.5. They want us to determine the general solution of this and that. So with this aspect of general solution where we have um, different angles, and also different trig ratios. All we need to do is create the same trig ratios on the left as well as the right hand side. So if I have the sine of five theta, for me to get a sine this side, I have to introduce a 90. Plus. So if I have, let's say, a sine of um, 90, let me use minus theta minus 14. Then if we have the same ratios, then you can drop the these two ratios so that I have just five theta is equal to, can simplify that so that I have 90 minus minus is gonna be a plus. So 90 plus 40 is gonna be just 130. 130 minus theta, move the theta that side, but then I have to plus the k times 360. And then k becomes an element of integers. So that's going to be six theta is equal to 130 plus k times 360. Divide through by six, so theta becomes uh, 130 divided by six, that's gonna be 21,67 degrees plus divide by six, k times 60 is an element of integers. So that is going to be the first quadrant. Then in the other quadrant, I would look at five theta is equal to the 180 minus the simplified version of 130 minus plus k times 360. That's in the second quadrant. Then my five theta is equal to one that is going to be 50 plus theta. Move it that side. We have four theta is equal to 50 plus k times 360. Divide through by four. So 50 divided by four, I'll get a 12 comma five degrees plus k times 90. K is an element of integer. So Regardless of how we obtained this answer of ours, what matters okay, is uh, how do we go about the general solution? That is a key aspect. So sometimes we can have general solutions that involve quadratic equations, or we have this aspect where the trig ratios are different because we can have the trig ratios different, but the angles are the same then we, in that way we can use the identities of the tan. But for as long as the angles are different and the trig ratios are different as well, then apply or create the same trig ratios on either sides of the equal signs. Okay, so that is question number four. Question number five, which will be the trig rules. In the diagram below, PQ, the vertical tower QRS are points on the same horizontal plane. The angle of elevation is theta, and then uh, x and x are equal. Can we determine QR in terms of theta and x? Where is QR? QR is here. So what we can see is that if we have right angle triangles, apply the trig ratios the way they are. So if I have this as my x, they are looking for this, I can apply tan. So I can say that the tan of theta is equal to the opposite, which is x, over the adjacent, which is qr. Make qr the subject. That's going to be x over the tan of theta. That is done. Then 5.2. 5.2, they want us to show that qs, this distance, 
is given as this whole expression. Yo, 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 yo. So we have this as x over the turn of theta. Okay. So what are we gonna use? It has to be the cosine rule. Cosine rule. Okay, so with the cosine rule, we know that um, QS is going to be the same as, um, no, let's say QS squared. It's going to be the same as SR squared plus QR squared minus two QR SR, the cos of SRQ. Okay, I do the substitution. My SR is X. My QR is gonna be X squared over tan squared of theta minus two x and then x over the turn of theta multiplied by the force of 120. Okay, so if I simplify that, I'm going to have um, x squared plus x squared over tan squared of theta minus 2x squared over tan theta but we know that the cos of 120, cos of 120 is gonna be negative a half, negative a half. Okay, then all I need to do is take out what is common, which is x squared. I'll be left with a one plus one over and squared theta minus, this is gonna cancel that, the negative and negative will give me a plus. So that's just gonna be a plus one over tan theta. All right, it's coming out guys. So Q squared, take square roots on either sides. So that cancels, which means QS is square root of X squared is just X. Then we have that one left. All right, guys, so that is that. Then if x is 15 and theta is 22, calculate the size of qs. So we just substitute. So when I substitute that, it's going to be 15 into the root of 1 over the tan of 22 squared plus 1 over tan of 22 plus 1. Okay, so if I do that, if I do that, 15, Say so square root of one over. Let me say the tan of twenty two. Close the bracket and then you square that. And then we plus the one over. Say so tan twenty two. Close that. Then plus one. That gives me 46,48 centimeters. Okay, so if that is a 46,48, the next part is asking us to calculate the angle of QPS. QP. So QPS, how many masks is that? It's two. So QPS, just this angle here. So since I have this as a 40, 40 mark, 46,48. We have our X as 15. We can use 10. Okay, so I'm going to say that's going to be the actan of the opposite, which is 46,48 over 15. And if that happens, I'm going to get a 72,11 degrees. Please just confirm it with your calculators that side and we we'll see 46,48 over 15. Two seven two, comma one one. All right.
Question number six, which is the trig functions. We have f of x, f of x, sine two x, and then g of x is tan x minus one. Draw the following between negative 45 and 180. Okay, so like we said, sometimes you could be given this. Okay, now times you could be told to plot or to draw. So regardless of which format comes, you need to know how to do the interpretation of all this. So that, let me just use this as a negative 45, zero. This is a 45, we're going up to 180. Okay, this is 90, 135, and then 180. What is my biggest asymptote? No, my biggest um, amplitude it would be a one. And just leave it as a negative two, negative one, and probably a negative two. Okay, so all you have to do is uh, use your calculators and your tables and all of that. Yeah? So if I use my calculator and get those values of the tables, we know that my first value at negative 45 is going to be negative one. Zero is gonna be zero. Then 45 is gonna be a one. Then that's gonna be a zero. It's a negative one and then a zero. So all I'll do is get your free hand and then connect that. So please and please the turning points, give them the necessary curve that they need to show that they are turning points. Okay, so that is F. Then uh, for us to get the G, do the same thing with the tan. Remember the tangent graph always has some asymptotes. Yeah? So we have an asymptote at 90, since it's just a tan graph. The other one is meant to be at 270 and so on, but it's not gonna work since we are looking at that. So we know that uh, at negative 45, we're gonna end up with a negative two. Then zero is negative one, that's a zero. And then the graph continues. Down this side, we have uh, negative one for this. 180. Then 135 is negative 2. Just in that format. So, which means we just need to connect this to that. And then it should just move towards the asymptote. Same story with this. You must just move towards the asymptote. So, this is your F. Then uh, use the graphs to determine the values where sine two x is greater than zero. So where do we find the graph of f to be above the x-axis? So it's between zero and 90. That's the only region where the graph is above the x-axis. So we're going to say zero is less x, is less, um, you said 90, no? Yeah. Then uh, next, f and g to be greater or equal to zero. So it's either both graphs are going to be below the x or both graphs must be above the x-axis. So if I look at for both graphs to be below, mm -hmm, I have this zero up until here. So negative 45 is less or equal to x, less or equal to zero. Both graphs are below. Then still, between this section, both graphs are below. So I'm going to say 90 is less x, less or equal to 180. That is category number two. And then the last one is this one. Between 45 and 90, both of them are above. Okay, so I'll say 45 is less or equal to x, less or equal to, but I'll just say less because one graph shouldn't get to a 90. 
Okay, so I have that, that, and that. So those are the three conditions. Then if h of x is f of x plus two, write down the range of h. So range is basically the y values. Now we're saying you're moving this graph two units up. So it's one and two. And then it's one and two. So which means it's gonna be at a three and a one. So the range in that case is gonna be one less or equal to y less or equal to a three. Or simply y is an element of one and three. So that is how that question would have been approached. Question number seven. So remember sometimes they can just give you the graphs drawn for you. Then they ask you for the amplitude. Then they ask you for all those things and all these ones will still be applicable. All right, then um, question number seven, which is the start of the Euclidean theorem. Now, before we start the Euclidean, just remember how to prove some theorems. The theorems of interest when it comes to proving will be the first one, line from the center perpendicular to the chord, bisects the chord. Pay attention to these theorems. Then this next one that they love to ask when it comes to proving is that angle at the center being twice the angle at the circumference. And then lastly, the one that they love is the tan chord theorem, okay? If you have to prove that a triangle is wara, 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 tan chord. So we need to know at least how to prove Basically, those three. The other one is uh, the cyclic or lateral being supplementary, but please just go to the exam knowing at least how to prove one of those. Then uh, in the diagram below, O is the center, SR is 40, SR is a 40, OT is perpendicular. It's also given that UT is X, OU is 2X, and so on and so forth. Can we determine the length of OR? in terms of x. So you can say that um, OR is the same as OT, which is 3x. Do we need a reason for that? No, it's a one more thing. This is a 3x. But they told us SR is a 40, so this is gonna be a 20, and then that is also gonna be a 20. So they want us to get the value of x, leaving your answer in the simplest side form. Okay. So what we're going to do is um, we're gonna use the theorem of Pythagoras because this is theorem one, which deals with the Pythagoras. So that's gonna be OR squared is equal to OU squared plus UR squared. So OR squared is gonna be three X, we square that. OU is going to be 2x, we square that, and then UR is going to be 20 squared. So 9x squared is equal to 4x squared plus 400. Move it that side, you have 5x squared is equal to 400. Divide both sides by 5, x squared is going to be equal to 80. Is that possible for us to find the square root of... Um, square root of 18, which is four root five. So X is four root five. So that is what I end up with. I don't know why it looks straightforward, but that's how I've gone about it for five months. Then 7.2, if O is the center of the circle, mm-hmm. A, B, C are points, A, B, C, they are points in the circumference circle such that we have lines that are parallel. O, B, A is a 54, they gave it to us. Now they want us to get the size of A to this angle here. Okay, so what we need to know is uh, if this is a 54, which means A1, is also going to be a 54. Okay, those are alternate angles. 
because OD is parallel to AB. Then if that is true that this is a 54, we just need to know if this is our angle at the center, then A2 is angle at the circumference. So A2 is going to be 27. Angle at the center is twice angle at the circumference. All right, so that is how we would have obtained our A2, which is 27, because we have this. Remember, this theorem can come in four different ways, okay? So it can be that, or it can be that, or it can also be in that format also, this and that. Pay attention to that. All right, then um, they want us to get the size of C, this angle here. What do we see? What do we see? Okay, so we can see that um, this C can also be angle at the circumference, which means it should be equivalent to the angle that side. Okay, so I'm going to say 360 minus 54. So 360, is it making sense? Yes. So 360 minus 54 is uh, 306. Then I'll divide it by two. Okay, divide that by two, which is one five three. So one five three degrees. All right. So that is how I would have obtained that. So reason for that is going to still be going to be the angle at the center. It's going to be twice angle at the circumference. This is three or six. And where the center will be twice angle on the circumference. Then they want us to prove that BA is going to divide A, O, B, O, A, B, O, A, B. That is line. So in that case, all we need to do is just prove that A1. If we can prove that A1 is a 27, then we are good to go. So D1 is a 27. Those are alternate angles because all D is prior to a, B, okay? So if that is a 27, and we know, and we know, what else do we know? What else do we know? How many marks is it? It's three marks, yeah? So it means it's, it, it should be straightforward. It should be straightforward, straightforward. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. We know that this is a radius, and then that is also a radius. So angles opposite of a size. Right? So we're going to say that um, A1 is going to be 27 angles opposite equal size. So if that is true, then we can draw a conclusion that there are four DA bisects or AB. Okay, so that is how we would have approached question number seven. All right, question number eight, there we go. In the diagram, DA is a tangent. So people love the DA. To the circle with center O, can we use the diagram above to prove the theorem that states that this angle DAB is the same as BCA, this angle. So whenever you have to prove, remember, the constructions. Remember to do the construction. Now, if you do these constructions on your question papers, please make sure you check out that construction work and attach it to your answer book. So you can have it that way, call that a T, and just follow the steps. I'm not going to go through this because different learners will have different approaches to proving that theorem. But that should be the kind of construction that you have. You can put that side, or you can even extend it was the B and then tell us that this is a 90 because of a tan radius and then uh, you tell us what's happening because we also have angles in the same segment and so on and so forth. Then 8.2 will be the application of that theorem or some other theorem as well combined. So in the diagram O is the center, 
we have a 17, we have a 51. Yeah, and then they want us to get the size of R1. So R1, where are you R1? So R1 is here. So what we know is that for as long as PU is the diameter, the whole of R is going to be a 90. R1 is going to be 90 minus 51, which must give us some, um, is it a 39? Reason, angle in a semicircle. Okay, angle in a semicircle. That's what we need to first of all know. Then 8.2.2, we're saying this is uh, 39. They want us to get O1. So how does O1 relate to what we just calculated? We know that O1 is at the circumference. Sorry, O1 is at the center, and then R1 is at the circumference, so which means O1 must be twice that. So that's going to be 7, 8. So that is 7, 8. Angle at the center is twice angle at the circumference. Okay, having done that, so we say this is a 39, that's a 78. We need to get Q1. Q1. All I know is that this is a radius, that's the radius, so which means this angle must be the same as that angle. So what I'm going to do, I'll get my 180 minus 78 because of angles in a triangle. And then uh, if I get 180 minus 78, then the answer I get, which is 102, I'll divide it by two, which becomes a 51. Okay, so alternatively, somebody would have just obtained the P2. You tell us that P2 is 51 from here. And then angles in the same segment. And since Q1 is the same as P2, angles opposite, equal sides. So whichever way you do it, we shall be glad. So we're saying Q1 is going to be a 51. And then how do we get U1? This angle here. So U1 must be a combination of this 17 and 51. Make it angles in the same segment. So we're going to get 51 plus 17, which is 68 degrees. Angles in the same segment. So that is how we would have approached that question. Eight. Then question number nine, almost there. Question number nine, telling us that um, Okay, so if we have a tangent, BFE at B, and all of that, we have that as straight line, we have some parallel lines as indicated, they're telling us that um, FEB is X, FEB is X, which is the same as BEC, and then this is a Y as indicated. So what is the first question saying? Calculate in terms of X and Y, the size of the following, and we must give our reasons, okay? A, B, F. A, B, F. They want us to get that. So what we know is that A, B, F is going to be X. Reason, that is the tan code theorem. Okay? For two marks. Then B, C, D. B, C, D. B, C, D. This entire angle. So what I'm seeing is that uh, how many tangent is this a tangent? A, B, C is a tangent to the circle at B. And from C, there's a straight line that is drawn that is parallel. Okay, so we say that is X. And if this is X, which means the whole of this is going to be X. But the question is asking for B, C, so which means it's also X. The reason those are corresponding angles because F B is part two D C. All right, then now uh, can we prove that B C is a cyclic code B E D C B E D C B E D C. So this area is a cyclic code. So for us to prove that. We can use the bow tie since we don't have any angles. 
So it's either we prove that this angle is the same as this. Okay. And if that works, or we can prove that this one is the same as that, or this is the same as that, whichever way we, we want to do it. So what we're going to do, or what we need to look at, is that since this was x, and then this one is also x, what I need to prove is um, d2, the size of d2. If I look at the parallel sides, you know that this angle must be the same as this entire angle. And if that works, then I'll be more than perfect. So let's see, BDC. What is BDC? We're saying that BDC is going to be x. BDC is going to be x because those are angles within the same segment. Okay, and then FDB is also x. FDB is also x. This one, because of angles that are in the same segment. Okay, but will that even make sense if I use that? But let me just use what I already have. Yeah? The bottle is not going to, it's, it's actually one mark. Oh, it's me. One mark so for me to be struggling like that. So 9.2, let's use the exterior angle. This angle is the same as this one. So we're saying that uh, FDB is the same as angle C, which is X. So exterior angle of the cyclic part. Was the question asking for the reason for why? Oh, thank Lord, thank Lord. So it's just the exterior angle of the cyclic part. Okay, so since we proved that it's a cyclic part, which means that we can now bring in all the aspects that we want. So meaning that um, if this is a Y, then this is also going to be a Y. Angles in the same segment. Yeah? This is X, which means that is also going to be X. Okay, what is the next question asking for? They want us to give which other two angles will be equal to X. So I've already said that D2 is X angles in the same segment. Okay, two angles. So we have this as X. Then if we look at the parallel lines, then we're saying FBD is also X. Okay, FBD is also X. Those are alternate angles because of the lines that are parallel. So FB is parallel to CD. FB is parallel to CD. Then lastly, question number 10, the diagram below. We still have a cyclic board where those sides are equal. We have tangents that are touching the circle at different points. So one thing we know about the tangents that touch the circle or the tangents that are coming from one point is that those tangents are going to be equal to each other. Okay, so they're asking us the reason for why B1 and B2 are the same. So why is B1? Where is B1? Is this B1 and B2? Why is B1 the same as B2? Because we're seeing that this and that, is it gonna be more or less the same thing? Why is B1 same? No, they actually want us to prove that B1 is the same as that. They don't want the reason. Ish. Fatigue is kicking in. All right, so what we can start by saying is that uh, D is the same as C3. C3 is the same as D. Okay. 
those are angles that are opposite equal sides. Yeah? Then if this is a cyclic quad, then we know that B1 is going to be the same as D because of the exterior angles of a cyclic quad. And if that is also true, we just now need to prove the B2 aspect. We know that C3 and B2, C3 and B2 are equal because of the bow tie. Angles in the same segment or angles subtended by the same code of segment or something of set. And then since we are seeing that uh, C3 the same as B2, therefore B1 is the same as B2. All right, then 10.2, can we prove that pH is a cyclic quad? B, A, C, H. So it's saying B, C, E, and H. B, C, E, H. Okay. So what we can see, or what we can identify, we can also use the exterior angle if we so wish of the B2. So what I'm going to do is um, I'll say C1 and C2 should be equivalent to D. C1 and C2 will be equivalent to a D. The reason for that is going to be the turn code. And if that is true, we remember we say that B2 is the same as C1 and C2. Say B2 is the same as C1 and C2. Therefore, B, E, C, H is a cyclic quad. If we need the reason, that's going to be the exterior angle of a cyclic quad, but we can use the combos since we want to prove that it's a cyclic quad. All right, then lastly, we just need to prove that CA is a tangent. CA is a tangent to what? We need to prove that CA is a tangent to a circle as passing through A, B, and T. CA is a tangent that is passing to a circle that is passing there. So it means we need to prove that this A2 is the same as um, P1. In other words, we need to use the turn code aspects. Ne? All right, so what are we going to do then? I'll say that B2 is going to be A3 plus T1. B2 is A3 plus T1, just that. Then uh, previously, we say that uh, C1 and C2 must give us a B2. So where there is B2, I'm going to replace with that. But we know that HT and CT, they are tangents that are from the same point. Okay? This is equal to that, which means this angle here, C1 and C2, must be the same as A2 and A3. So C1 plus C2 should be the same as A3 plus T1. But, but we said C1 and C2 must be the same as A2 and A3. A2 and A3. So A2 plus A3 should be the same as A3 plus A. A2 and A3 is the same as C1 and C2. Okay, I'll keep this. So the A3 cancels the A3, therefore A2 is the same as T1. Then draw the conclusion that CA is a tangent. So guys, I'll just stop there for now, but uh, just wish you guys all the best. So remember the basics that we went over, the Euclidean carries like 50 marks out of 150. 
close to that. So just know how to do your proofs and how to connect, okay? Connect the angles with the theorems that we already know. And then uh, we said we have the Euclidean of, of the theorems that you need to really prove. Then now uh, we also have the trick, the graphs, this question, oh, we saw that part, the trick rules, the sign rule, the cosine rule, and so on, okay? So just know, sign rule, area rule, as well as the cosine rule. And then the rest will be just history. So I wish you guys all the best as you prepare for this paper. And I wish to see you or hear from you in grade 12 next year. All the best and bye-bye.